Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very challenging one on the Gospel of Mark. This is lesson number three in that series for July 20th, 2024, entitled Controversies. Mm -hmm. You think there were a few controversies <laughs> in the Gospel of Mark? We've already run across a number of them, haven't we? Well, let's begin as usual with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you now, recognizing your presence among us and asking you to guide us in our discussion. May we see and understand what we need to know to prepare ourselves for your soon coming is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus faced many controversies with the regular, with, with, I'm sorry, with the religious authorities. Mark recounts several of them. Jim? From the Bible study guide, Mark 2, verses 1, excuse me, Mark 2, 1, 2, 3, 6, yeah. contain five stories that illustrate Jesus' teaching in contrast to the teaching of the religious leaders. The stories are in a specific pattern in which the, each successive story links to the one before via a tip, topical parallel. The final story circles around and recon reconnects the first one. Each one of these stories illustrates aspects of who Jesus is, as exemplified by the statement in Mark 2, verse 10, 17, 20, and 28. Our studies will delve deeper into the meaning of these accounts and Christ's statements in them from the Bible study guide. Okay, so let's look at these verses. It's not going to be obvious right now how these things are all connected, but let's see what, if we can understand. Mark 2, 10, 17, 20, and 28. I will prove to you then that the, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralytic man. Okay, here's the first story. Let's look at this. Just, just take a second here. He's going to prove that he has the power to forgive sins by doing what? Miracle. Healing the man. Healing the man. Okay. Right. Verse 17. Jesus heard them and answered, People who are well do not need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call uh, respectable people, but outcasts. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to find out that he's in a very bad place when he says this, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and so what does Jesus say? But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will then fast. Then they will fast. This is a question about fasting. Right. Okay. So the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath day. Yes. So we're going to try to see if we can figure out as we work our way through these things how they are linked. These stories are followed by Mark 3, 20 and 35, which describe Jesus' family coming to speak with him because they thought he was losing his mind. At the same time, the Pharisees accused him of performing miracles with the power of Beelzebul, in other words, Satan. So what's going on here? Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide for Sabbath Afternoon, what we will see, too, is an example of a technique the Gospel writer uses that is called, quote, sandwich stories, end quote. That's a method in which one story is in interrupted by another story, and then there is return to the first story. This narrative pattern appears at least six times in Mark. In each case, some important aspect of the nature of Christ, uh, nature of Jesus, and his role as Messiah, or the nature of discipleship, is the focus. Okay, so we've got lots of things to work out here. He's, he's giving us a lot of challenges. In Mark 2, 1 through 12, which is the story of the paralyzed man who was let down to the roof of Peter's house, let's uh, take a moment and, and read that. A few days later, Jesus went back to Capernaum and the news spread that he was at home. So many people came together that there was no room left, not even out in front of the door. Jesus was preaching the message to them when four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man to Jesus. Because of the crowd, however, they could not get the man to him. 
So they made a hole in the roof right above the place where Jesus was. When they had made an opening, they let the man down, lying on his mat. Seeing how much faith they had, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Whose house was this? Peter's. Peter's. Would you be happy to see people tearing a hole in your roof? <laughs> Not quite the same as today. Not quite the same? Some teachers of the law who were sitting there thought, thought to themselves, how does he dare to talk like this? This is blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sins. At once, Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he said to them, why do you think such things? Is it easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your mat and walk? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said, by the way, notice Son of Man. What is he saying? This human being has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat and go home. While they all watched, the man got up, picked up his mat and hurried away. They were all completely amazed and praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. All of them praise God except for who? The spies, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, okay, from the Bible study guide, you want me to? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the man was paralyzed. His four friends therefore had to carry him to Jesus. After they tore through the roof and let the man down into Jesus' presence, Mark 2, 5 notes that Jesus saw their faith. How can faith be visible? Like love, it becomes visible in actions, as the persistence of fr the friends openly illustrates. The okay. man obviously needed, obvious need. The man's was, obvious yes, need. Was obvious need was physical. However, when he comes into Jesus' presence, the first words Jesus pronounces refer to forgiveness of sins. The man speaks not a word during the entire scene. Instead, it is the religious leaders who object in their minds to what Jesus is, has just said. They consider his words blasphemous, slandering God and taking on prerogatives that belong only to God. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be true, but... Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so guess who's, guess who's talking, yeah. right? Jesus meets the objectors on their own ground by using a, a typical rabbinic, sty rabbinic. rabbinic style of argumentation called lesser to greater. Okay, let me interrupt for just try to help explain that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So you do something and they say, you can't do that or that's bad. So he says, okay, I'll do something even bigger. Go ahead. Okay. It is one thing to say that a person's sins are forgiven. It is another thing to actually make a paralyzed man walk. If Jesus can make the man walk by the power of God, then his claim to forgive sins finds affirmation. Okay. So what do you do if you're trying to trap Jesus and something like that happens? Okay, let me, let me help make the story a little more complicated. The Jewish leaders believed that any major disease was a result of some sin that, had, that that individual or his or her parents had committed. And what story can you think of that, that tells us that? Uh, the man at the John 9 with the man who was born blind, right? Yes. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Right. So in their belief, one's sins must be forgiven in order for his or her sickness or disease to be healed. In this case, the man's problem was apparently caused by some former sins that he had committed. Ellen White suggests that. When his friends offered to take him to Jesus to be healed, his greatest concern was about forgiveness of his sins. And from the writings of Ellen White, Yet it was not physical restoration that he desired so much as relief from the burden of sin. If he could see Jesus and receive the assurance of forgiveness and peace with heaven, he would be content to live or die according to God's will. We wish we understood more about what it was all involved with that and why he felt like that, but we don't. 
The cry of the dying man was, Oh, that I might come into his presence. There was no time to lose. Already his wasted flesh was showing signs of decay. He besought his friends to carry him on his bed to Jesus. And this, was, this they gladly undertook to do. But so dense was the crowd that had assembled in, in and about the house where Jesus was, um, where the Savior was, I'm sorry, that it was impossible for the sick man and his friends to reach him or even to come within hearing of his voice. Desire of Ages 2, 67. So, so what disease did this man have? Well. Paralyzed supposedly from something that he had done. Did he have tertiary syphilis? Well, that's a good possibility. Yeah, that's what some doctors would suggest. Yeah. Possibly. Okay, Jim. E. G. Ellen White. The Savior looked upon the mournful countenance and saw the pleading eyes fixed upon him. He understood the case. He had drawn to himself that perplexed and doubting spirit. While the paralytic was yet at home, the Savior had brought conviction to his conscience. Now I'm going to interrupt for a second. Okay, now, Jesus seems to say we're supposed to follow his example. How did he do this? Influence this guy far away. Well, didn't Jesus heal people at a distance also? He right. did. So what's, what's the difference? <laughs> well, do you know how to do that? No. I don't either. I'm trying to figure out how Jesus did it. Well, he's God. Yeah, okay. But he was supposed to be acting like a human being here. Okay, I'm sorry, Jim, go ahead. When he repented of his sins and believed in the power of Jesus to make the, him whole, the life-giving mercies of the Savior had first blessed his longing heart. Jesus had watched the first glimmer of grow, faith grow into a belief that he was the sinner's only helper and had seen it grow stronger with every effort to come into his presence. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 6, excuse me, 268, paragraph 1. So my question there, how did Jesus know about this case while the man was still at home? What was or were the issues between the religious leaders and Jesus? Does Micah 668 help us to understand that question and its answer? Micah 6628. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn as offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep and endless uh, streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No. The Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Amen. Okay, That's Gordon. That's Roland Zimmerman. That was his, one of his favorite verses. Yeah, well, you can understand why, can't you? Yeah. And so what's happening here? Here's the, these religious leaders in their minds accusing Jesus and wishing they could destroy him. And he's quoting from you, the Old Testament, you know, what? <laughs> you have all your ceremonies, you do all these things. What about some justice and some righteousness and some good actions now? I don't think uh, the Jewish leaders spent a lot of time in the prophets. You don't think so? They, were, I mean, they, they, must, they, have, they, they must have memorized some of them. Yeah, they, they, they were more in, in, anybody that produces a documents like the Mishnah and the Torah, and, and or not the Torah, but the uh, Talmud, and that, that kind of a mentality is control the masses. There's no freedom with all of that. <laughs> okay, Gordon. From the Bible Study Guide, these religious leaders lost sight of what really mattered, justice, mercy, and walking humbly before God, as Micah 6, 6 to 8 said. So obsessed with defending their understanding of God, they were blinded to God's working right before their eyes. Nothing indicated that the men changed their minds about Jesus, even though he gave mm. them more than enough evidence to know that he was from God. 
not only by letting them know that he could read their minds, which <laughs> no, no simple, simple feet feet. <laughs> in and of itself, yes. but also by healing the paralytic in their presence in a way they could not deny. Now, some of these guys must have realized that they were on the wrong side of this issue. I mean, well, they, they put it together later, many of them. Some, of the, some did. Many of them, after the resurrection, put Fortunately. it together. Fortunately. Ascension, mm -hmm. put it together. But I really believe pride got on the way. Who is this? A 14-year-old girl was made pregnant, but this is according to them, by a Jewish uh, uh, soldier. Yeah. And this kid is bastard. And that's what Talmud calls him, by the way, even to this day. Uh, what kind of audacity does he have to be talking to us this way? Yeah. They just couldn't, just couldn't accept this. Mark 2, 13 to 17. Let me just read that. Jesus went back again to the shores of Lake Galilee. Now, what, he, what had he already done there? Pray. Called disciples. A okay. crowd came to him and he started teaching them. As he walked along, he saw a tax collector, Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in his office. Jesus said to him, follow me. Levi got up and followed him. Now, this is a different situation. We've already said that the other men that followed him, they probably already had some significant amount of experience with Jesus. But a tax collector? Where did he know? About, how did he learn about Jesus? Mm -hmm. Later on, Jesus was having a meal in Levi's house. A large number of tax collectors and other outcasts were following Jesus, and many of them joined him and his disciples at the table. Some teachers of the law were, who were Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with these outcasts and tax collectors, so they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such people? Jesus heard them and answered, people who are well do not need a doctor, but only those who are sick. I have not come to call respectable people, who would that be, but outcasts. Hmm. This section relates to the story of Jesus calling Levi Matthew from his work as a tax collector. Later, Jesus ate at a great feast held by Levi at his home. This was completely contrary to the teachings and rigid rules of the Pharisees. A little later, Jesus was accosted by the Pharisees and scribes because his disciples were not fasting as the Pharisees and John's disciples did. Okay? okay. From Desire of Ages. Fasting was practiced by the Jews as, it, as an act of merit and the most rigid among them fasted two days in every week. Wow. Yeah. The Pharisees and John's disciples were fasting when the latter came, when the latter came to Jesus with an inquiry. Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? Okay. From Desire of Ages, page 276. And Ellen White goes on. Yeah. The true fast is no mere formal service. This is not just staying away from the dinner table. The scripture describes the fast that God has chosen to loosen the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke, to draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 10. Here is set forth the very spirit and character of the work of Christ, his whole life was a sacrifice of himself for the saving of the world. Whether fasting in the wilderness of temptation or eating with the publicans at Matthew's house, he was giving his life for the redemption of the lost. Not an idle mourning or a mere bodily humiliation and multitudinous sacrifices is the true spirit of devotion manifested, but it is shown in the surrender of self and willing service to God and man. So that's true what? True fasting. Continuing his answer to the disciples of John, Jesus spoke a parable saying, no man put a piece of a new garment upon the old if otherwise, and then both the new, the new make the rent and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And the message of John the Baptist was not to be interwoven with the traditions and superstitions. An attempt to blend the pretense of the Pharisees with the devotion of John would only make more evident the breach between them. While they re remained satisfied with the legal religion, it was impossible for them to become 
the depositaries of the living truth of heaven. Whoa. Desire of Ages 278. Okay, so she goes on. Jim? The legal religion can never lead souls to Christ, for it is a loveless, Christless religion. Fasting or prayer that is actuated by self-justifying spirit is an abomination in the sight of God. Let me, let me interrupt for a second. So how does fasting be, is, is, is how, what, how is that self-justifying? They walk down the street looking like they're so hungry. And people say, oh, you must be fasting. Oh, yes, I'm fasting. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. I'm fasting and I'm righteous. Yes, exactly. The schism. The solemn assembly. I mean, the solemn assembly for worship, the round of religious ceremonies, the external humiliation, the imposing sacrifice, proclaim that the doer of these things regards himself as righteous and is entitled to heaven, but it is all a deception. Our own works can never purchase salvation. Ellen White Desire of Ages. That's page pretty blunt, isn't it? I think Isaiah 58, I'm 50, trying to find 50, it. Yeah, that's what it is. He it's says, it says the, 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 verses 6 and 10. I don't like all these sacrifices you bring to me. Yeah. It's, no, Isaiah, Isaiah 58. 13 and 14. Well, what do you... If which, you... He says, what if you... If you turn away your foot from right. the Sabbath, that's 13 and 14. Right, right. But initially it says, I don't like what you do. That's not mm -hmm. what I'm asking for. That's earlier. Well, here. It is not to deal with thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring to the poor that are cast into thy house, then thou seest the naked, cover him, and that thou hide not thyself in front. This had to do with, uh, with fasting someplace yeah. here. Well, excuse me, it, it, verse 6, 58, 6. Yeah. It is not, is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that, that ye break every yoke. That's, yeah. That was the one I was looking for. Yeah, and that's the one we read a little bit ago. Yeah. Okay, tax collectors. This is an important thing. I hadn't realized quite this fact earlier. Tax collectors were despised by most Jews, and we could understand that. Okay, but look what the Bible study guide says about that. Charles? The tax collectors of Jesus' days were civil servants under the local or Roman government. They were unpopular among the Jewish population in Judah because they often exalt, exactly. exacted more than required and became rich of their own countrymen. A Jewish contemporary Co commentary. commentary on religious law, the Mishnah, Mishnah. Mishnah translate uh, Tractate to Haroth. Haroth saying, Those are complicated so, words. Right, right, right. <laughs> the tax gatherers extended their uh, house. That, all, okay? Okay, if tax, collect, tax gatherers Enter a house. house. Now we're talking about, this is Jesus at a feast at Simon uh, yes. Levi Matthew's house. If tax gatherers enter a house, all that is within it become unclean. Wow. <laughs> so Jesus is unclean according to their eyes. According to that. Right. What was the outcome of Jesus' interaction with these tax collectors? Gordon? At such gatherings as this, not a few were impressed by the Savior's teaching who did not acknowledge him until after his ascension. When the Holy Spirit was poured out and 3,000 were converted in a day, there were among them many who first heard of the truth at the table of the publicans. Wow. And some of these became messengers of the gospel. To Matthew himself, the example of Jesus at the feast was a constant lesson. The despised publican became one of the most devoted evangelists in his own ministry, following closely in his master's steps. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 274. Okay. So Mark 2, 18 to 23, we read a moment ago, deals with Jesus' answer to the accusations of the scribes and Pharisees about Jesus' disciples not fasting like the scribes and Pharisees and even the disciples of John the Baptist. So he, how he, he, remember, he compares it as putting a new piece of cloth, try to con 
put it into this or something in, in, a, in a, a skin from an animal. And what happens? The new stuff shrinks and tears the old stuff, right? right. Jesus, so in other words, Jesus tried to suggest that the legalistic religion of the Pharisees could not be mixed with truth. The two were incompatible. Yes. Sorry. The Bible study guide for Monday, July 15 says, Jesus continues with two illustrations that highlight the contrast between his teaching and that of the religious leaders. Unshrunk cloth on an old garment and new wine in old wineskins. And new wine in old wine, yeah. Yeah. What an interesting way to contrast the teaching of Christ and the religious <laughs> leaders. Yes. Guess which part there he's talking yeah. about. It shows how corrupted the ways of the teachers had become. True religion can be turned into darkness. Even if, true religion can be. Yes, even tr true religion can be turned into darkness if people are not careful. So you may be reading the Torah or you may be reading Anyway, who today might be looked upon as a tax collector as were in Jesus' day? Would they be drunkards, drug dealers, human traffickers? Politicians. Politicians, prostitutes. How should we adjust our thinking regarding them? In Mark 2, 23 to 24, we see Jesus countering the accusations of the Pharisees about the disciples breaking the Sabbath by picking heads of wheat and eating them. You remember they were, the, the service is over, they walk home, There's, they're walking through these fields of wheat, they pick a few of these things, they rub them together. I've done this many times as a child, rub the heads of wheat together and blow away the chaff. And, but that's, you, 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 you uh, harvested, you thrashed, you Processed. Yes. Baking it, a it trash. It was all okay uh, any time but Sabbath, but on yeah. Sabbath you can't do those things. No. Baking and thrashing and eating heads of wheat broke several of those rules. Jesus responded with the story the accusers knew well from the Old Testament. That must be mine. Jesus responded with the story of David's eating the sacred showbread, 1 Samuel 21, 1 to 6. The showbread was removed on the Sabbath. So David's journey may well have been an emergency escape on the Sabbath. Jesus argues that if David and his men were justified in eating the showbread, which is supposed to be only for the priests, remember, then Jesus' disciples were justified in picking and eating grain on the Sabbath. Wow. Okay, Mark 3, 1 through 6 now. This section relates to the story of the man with the withered or paralyzed hand. Let's... Um, Look at that. And Jesus went back to the synagogue where there was a man who had a paralyzed hand. Some people were there who wanted to accuse Jesus of doing wrong. So they watched him closely to see whether he would heal the man on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man, come up here to the front. He, then he said to the people, what does our law allow us to do on the Sabbath? To help or to harm, to save on someone's life or to destroy it? But they did not say a thing. Jesus was angry as he looked around at them, but at the same time he felt sorry for them because they were so stubborn and wrong. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it became well again. So the Pharisees left the synagogue and met at once with some members of Herod's party and then made plans to kill Jesus. Whoa. So what was the medical illness of that man? I think he had Klumpke's palsy, birth palsy. Whatever. Tearing the nerve roots from yeah. the brachial plexus and results in a paralyzed hand. Okay, they were accusing Jesus of breaking the Sabbath by making that man with the withered hand entirely whole while they were breaking his Sabbath by plotting his murder, as we just read. It's important to notice that there was no controversy over which day was the Sabbath. Okay, Jim. Jesus proceeds to heal the man, which angers his opponents who immediately start to plan his demise. The irony of the story is that those looking to catch Jesus in Sabbath breaking were themselves breaking the Sabbath by plotting his death that same day. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> oh, man. 
the next story we come to is one of the sandwich stories. Read Mark 3, 20 through 35. And we're running a little short on time. I'm not going to read that. It is the story of the family of Jesus beginning to think that he had gone mad because he was not even, even taking time to eat. They tried to get him to stop what he was doing. In verses 31 to 35, now we jump down, Jesus responded by saying that those who followed his teachings were his mother, brothers, and sisters. So now a little detour here. How many siblings did Jesus have? At least three, four. Were they older or younger than Jesus? Okay, you can tell us that, younger. Charles. What does it say? Younger. No, it doesn't. No, older. Old, older. Uh, well, they were the half. They were, they were half brothers, brothers and sisters. Right, right, right. Okay. Right. Yes. Go ahead. I'm supposed to read. Okay, Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 55 to 57, the people of Nazareth said, this is the place where I should read, right? Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? And aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brothers? Aren't all his sisters living here? Where did he get all this? And so they rejected him. Okay, name his sisters for me. <laughs> they aren't. Well, they had to be at least two of them if they're yeah, plural. Sisters, right. oh, well, so, so the, they aren't named. No, they're not named. Not anyway. And they, apparently the whole group of them came here and were, they were worried about what, what Jesus was, was going mad. Right. And credible as it may seem, in the early years of his ministry, Jesus was not only in conflict with the Pharisees and scribes and the party of Herod, but also he was in conflict with the members of his own family his brothers, and even his mother. Mother. Gordon? In conflict with his mother? Yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> How dare he? From Mrs. White. The enmity kindled in the human heart against the gospel was keenly felt by the Son of God, and it was most painful to him in his home, for his own heart was full of kindness and love, and he appreciated tender regard in the family relation. His brothers desired that he should concede to their ideas. Now, let's, let me interrupt for a second. Why did they think they should have the right to tell him what to do? They're older. older. They were older. older. Exactly. Yeah. Age okay. has, has privileges. At that time, anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> His brothers desired that he should concede to their ideas when such a course would have been utterly out of harmony with his, that is, God's uh, Jesus' divine mission. They looked upon him as in need of their counsel. Little brother, we can help you. Mm -hmm. They judged him from their human point of view and thought that if he would speak only such things as would be acceptable to the scribes and Pharisees, he would avoid the disagreeable controversy that his words aroused. Oh dear. They thought that he was beside himself in claiming divine authority and in placing himself before the rabbis as a reprover of their sins. They knew that the Pharisees were seeking occasion to accuse him, and they felt that he had given them sufficient occasion. In other words, he's guilty. Yeah. So he, try to imagine how you would feel about a younger brother who turns out to be God. Took them a long well, time, right? Many times. And Wow. Not until he left. Yeah. Did they and then they, then they said, oh. Wow. Yeah. But they were ready to take him to the psychiatrist, you know. Yeah. That. Right. And remember that these brothers of Jesus turned out to be church leaders mm -hmm. afterwards. afterwards. Right. Okay, go ahead. The, continuing with Desire of Ages. These things made his path a thorny one to travel. So pained was Christ by the misapprehension in his own home that it was a relief to him to go where it did not exist. There was one home that he loved to visit, the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. For in the atmosphere of faith and love, his spirit had rest. Yet there were none on earth who could comprehend his divine mission or know the burden which he bore in behalf of humanity. Often he would find relief only in being alone and communing with his heavenly Father. 
Wow. Desire of Ages 326. Don't you wish you could experience some of that? Yeah. How do you suppose that Jesus handled this opposition and controversy, not only from the scribes and Pharisees, but even from the members of his own family? Well, by telling a parable, Jesus suggested that he had broken into Satan's house and was releasing Satan's captives from darkness and setting them free. Jim? Mark. No, I'm sorry, the, um, Myra. Myra, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Is this uh, yeah. Mark 3, 28 to 30? I assure you that people can be forgiven all their sins and all the evil things they may say. But whoever says evil things against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven because he has committed the eternal sin. Jesus said this because some people were saying he was an evil spirit. And he had an e has an evil spirit in him. <laughs> Right. So the Holy Spirit is the one who makes our, well, I mean, what, so what are they saying? He's performing things with the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're saying he's performing things with an evil spirit, with, from the devil. Yes. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes our bodies work, including supporting all the organs, working together in all the metabolic processes which make the organs work. If we refuse to work with them, we just cut ourselves off from divine help. Jesus' accusers were rejecting the counsel of the Holy Spirit and claiming that Jesus was motivated, even empowered, by the devil. Um, I guess that's mine. The unpardonable sin is, in the, is the sin against the Holy Spirit, calling the work of the Spirit the work of the devil. Notice that in Mark 3, verse 30, the reason Jesus makes his statement in Mark 2, 28 and 29 is because the scribes are saying that he has an unclean spirit when in reality he, well, he has the Holy Spirit. If you call the work of the Holy Spirit the work of the devil, then you will not listen to the Holy Spirit because no one in his or her right mind wants to follow the devil's guidance. However, what do we know from Revelation 13 is going to happen at the end of this earth's, earth's history? Almost the whole world will follow the devil. Will worship the devil and wander after, I think, another person. Yeah, wander after them. Are there people today who deny the work or even the existence of the Holy Spirit? Many refuse to acknowledge the existence of God himself. Many also deny the existence of the devil. What do you think Jesus would say to them? Well, why does the... Why do... No comments? Well, that's why he said this, words I have spoken or spirit and truth. Yeah. Why does the fear that you might have committed the unpardonable sin reveal that you have not committed it? Why is the fear itself evidence that you have not? If one is still concerned about God's help, it suggests that she or he has not been cut off from God completely. Okay. But I, I'd like for us to go back to when they came and they realized that uh, Jesus has gone nuts we have to save him. Mm -hmm. And they, some of the folk there conveyed this message to him. Yeah. I think what he did is so beautiful, standing in front there. Mm -hmm. And his brothers, sisters, his mother probably w looking through the window or whatever, and they see him standing there, the younger brother. And he looks at the audience, the people, and says, these are my brothers and my sisters. That's a, and my mother. And my mother. I mean, if they were thinking, I said, that's a slap on their face. No, I don't need you guys. Mm -hmm. These are the ones who love my Heavenly Father. They're my brothers and sisters. I, that day needs to come desperately in this church. Yes. Desperately. Well, they had grown up with that. Jesus had done that to them many, many times. Many times they thought, okay, you need to... No, I'm going to do this. So they probably were not totally surprised. Okay. So if anyone is still concerned about God's, uh, I'm sorry, a charge of mental, I think that's mine, right? A charge of mental instability is quite serious. Typically this area arises from experiences where a person is a threat to his or her own safety. Jesus' family felt this way about him because he was so busy that he did not take time to stop to eat. They set out to take charge of him, and that is where the outer story, the sandwich, breaks off. 
interrupted by the inner story about the scribes charging Jesus with collusion with the devil. A strange parallel exists between the outer and inner stories of this sandwich story. Jesus' own family seems to have a view of him parallel to that of the scribes. The family says he's crazy. The scribes say it's in league with the devil. From our Bible study guide. Hmm. Those who do the will of God are his brothers, sisters, and mother. Charles, that's what you just mentioned. He is the son of God, and those who align themselves with the will of God becomes, become his family. So, Jim? The two stories of his Mark, Mark and Sandwich story together contain a deep irony. In the story, excuse me, in the inner story, Jesus says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. At first glance, it seems that in the outer story, Jesus' own house, his family, is divided against itself. Mm. But Jesus resolves this conundrum by his redefinition of family. His real family are those who do the will of God along with him. Luke 12, 53. Many times throughout history, Christians have found themselves alienated from their own relatives. It is difficult experience. It is a difficult mm -hmm. experience. This passage in Mark reveals that Jesus went through the same trouble. He understands that it is like and cannot comfort those who can, can, can comfort those who feel his own painful isolation from the Bible study guide. So Jesus went through that experience himself. And Ellen White tells us that as we approach near the end of this world's history, some of our closest friends are going to be our worst critics. Boy, family members even. So, continuing, with regard to the healing of the man with a withered hand. One question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? Jesus answered, what man shall there be among you that shall have one ship and it fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than the sheep? Wherefore, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Matthew 12, 10 okay. to 12. Okay. <laughs> Notice what it says next. Gordon? The spies dared not answer Christ in the presence of the multitude for fear of involving themselves in difficulty. Because the answer is so obvious, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Is it, it's okay to take a sheep, a, out of a a sheep pit. Or, or cow out of the pit, but not a human. Yeah, don't dare help a human. According to their rules. They knew that he had spoken the truth. Rather than violate their traditions, they would leave a man to suffer while they would relieve a brute because of the loss to the owner if it were neglected. Thus, greater care was, take, was shown for a dumb animal than for a man who is made in the image of God. This illustrates the working of all false religions. They originate in man's desire to exalt himself above God, but they result in degrading man below the brute. Every religion that wars against the sovereignty of God defrauds man of the glory which was his at the creation and which is to be restored to him in Christ. Every false teaching, every false religion teaches its adherents to be careless of human needs, sufferings, and rights. The gospel places a high value upon humanity as the purchase of the blood of Christ and it teaches a tender regard for the wants and woes of man. The Lord says, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Isaiah 13, 12, from Ellen White, Desire of Ages 2, 86 and 7. Okay. Are there any issues that cause us to be blinded? Yes. You're not going to like what I'm about to say. I just came back from a mission trip, by the way. Uh, there is, um, there's unfortunately, um, the way the church is structured, here is, here is the creator himself. 
He's, he's with the most ordinary people. And he's telling his family, look, my mom, my brothers and sisters, these are my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. They're slacking today within Adventism. It's very sad. Mm -hmm. We have built our ivory towers and our leaders are there. They do not know what's going on in the local churches. It's very sad. Yep. Well, are we, are there any Adventists ever motivated by hatred, tradition, dogma, or religious teachings in general? Well, my experience is Adventist leaders, many places of the world are motivated by power. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be something of history yeah. very soon. Well, 25, what about 2,500 years ago, Jeremiah 6, 13, the priests and the prophets are motivated by greed. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't fit into, into that uh, mold? It was not with the world, with the Lord, but it is now, and it's very sad. Well, at the end of this world, we're going to be Revelation 13 and 14. We're going to be divided up into two groups. One group worshiping God because his motivation is love. And the other group motivated by Satan, whose who's, who's, modus operandi is Greed. selfishness. Look around the world and see which do you think is most prominent, love or selfishness? <laughs> How could you say that? Yeah, wow. Well, it's really, truly really sad what's going on. One of the important aspects of this section of Mark is to notice that Jesus had a large crowd follow him almost everywhere he went. He did not confine his work to the synagogues. From the Bible study guide, it says, in short, this segment of Mark's account highlights that Jesus ministered to people in houses, in the city, in the synagogue, and even in rural areas. In this way, we can see Jesus served the people. His ministry was both urban and rural in his region. And I would expand that by saying what this means is that so many people are following Jesus, including Pharisees, scribes, and spies, that he was constantly ministering. There was not enough room for the crowds to get in inside any building. Jesus ministered to people wherever he found them. Amen. In this section, we have seen a marked opposition by Pharisees, scribes, and even Herodians. However, it is important to notice that the Sadducees where were they? They were in the temple. They were not mentioned. That is because the work of the Sadducees was confined almost exclusively to the temple in Jerusalem and Jesus was not there. Where, are we, where is he ministering now in this story? <clears throat> Galilee. Around Capernaum and in Galilee, which is 50, 60, 70 miles away from Jerusalem. Okay. Myra, is it? That's me. Cheers. The challenge that Jesus faces now is not against the forces of darkness. The demons have no active role and no real power against him in this, in this series of narrative beyond what is mentioned in Mark 3, 11, wherein the author asserts the demons fell down prostrate before Jesus. So I guess if you can't obstruct his progress in any other way, you just fall on the ground before him. But clearly, they end up saying the truth about him. The conflict that Jesus is facing here is against something more concrete, the spiritual leaders or teachers of the nation, from our Bible study guide. Notice that Jesus could get the demons to recognize who he was, but he could not get the Jewish leaders to mm. do so. How does that apply today? Mm. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, it seems that God got these demons, formerly demon-possessed people, to say the truth. We talked about this earlier by taking control of them. Couldn't he have taken control of the religious leaders? No. <laughs> people have to show their character. That's, that's the opposite of freedom. Yes. Okay, so God is, does not control. How do you think that uh, this sin began in heaven? Yeah. Because of freedom. Okay, that's, I, that's why I asked you a little earlier the question about who is controlling these 
formerly demon-possessed people. All when we're asked to do is exercise self-control, mm -hmm. not ask for somebody else to come in and, and do it for us, and then maybe get, do something to, to uh, win so the favor. So what happens of, if you're already possessed by a devil? Well, the, the, the speak to you. Jesus spoke to the the devil or the or mm -hmm. the, his minions of, of whatever, and uh, they <laughs> realized they better leave. <laughs> okay. Not that. Not that, they knew he wasn't going to kill them. Yeah. He just you're not welcome there. Scholars have attested that Pharisees and, and scribes were associated with leading positions in Jewish society from approximately 200 years before the Christ to 100 years after. These two groups were the, liber were the literate and learned leaders of the nation living in diverse regions of the country. So what are we saying here? The university professors, the local teachers, all of them, those are the people, those are the people that people looked up to, right? And these are the ones. They're the page of Pharisees. They're the scribes. They're frauds. And, They're hypocrites. In some sense, the scribes and Pharisees represented the scholarly sector of their time. And from our Bible study guide. Okay, the Hasid were very strict were legal, strict legalists who were known for going beyond the requirements of the law. If you're told to fast one day, they fasted two days often for show, to be seen by and admired by other people. So one commentator uh, says this. Where are you, Jim? I think that's yours. Okay. Michelle Lee Barnwell, or Barnwall, excuse me, points out, the Pharisees may have arisen from the Hasidim with their ties to the scribes as the ones who emphasized the study of the law and obedience to the commandments, Lee so, Barnwell. Okay, and there's a bunch of stuff references there. But the point is, what, what these Hasid, what did they do? They went beyond. They tried to, they wanted everyone to see that they were doing even more than what their, well, the, the law required. They were showing off for their well, own benefit. Showing off? Hmm. How could you say such a thing? Well, that wasn't difficult. Because <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Flavius, can't, you can't handle the truth? Isn't that where the commercial goes? Flavius, Flavius Josephus was a Jew who often sided with the Romans. However, he was one of the few individuals who wrote extensively about Jewish and Roman relationships. Charles? Flavius Josephus describes the influence of these scholarly groups of uh, groups and the pressure they extended on the society in relation to the uh, traditions uh, surrounding the Torah. The Pharisees have delivered to the pe people a great many observances uh, by succession from their fathers, which are not with written in the law of Moses. Now, let me interrupt here for just a second. So what happened over the centuries they and their ancestors, trying to expound the, expand the law, said, well, if it says this, it must mean all these other things along with it. And it just kept going and going and going until they had, what, 603 rules for keeping the Sabbath, for example. Uh, well, is this also when they went back with Ezra and Nehemiah that they added quite a bit? They started with Ezra and Nehemiah that probably yeah. were doing well, and then from there on... And the one that went downhill. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, so the Father says, were not written in the law of Moses. And uh, for that reason, the Sadducees reject them and say that we are not esteemed those observances to be obligatory, which are in the not written in the Word, but are not to be observed what are derived from the uh, Tradition. traditions of the forefathers. Okay, so the Sadducees are saying, remember the, the Sadducees finally got to the place where they said, we're going to observe only what is written in the Torah, the five books of Moses. So they paid very little attention to the prophets. 
Yeah. And the prophets. The Sadducees, were, yeah. Huh? And the, yeah, and, and, the, the, and the purpose of the prophets was to communicate some a message yeah. to the to the masses, but the priests stood in the middle. Or, uh, to the Pharisees, their traditions were often considered more important than the scriptures themselves. Jesus clearly disagreed. By challenging their interpretations, he also was challenging their social status. The mission also reveals certain tensions that existed in relation to the teaching of the scribes. For instance, Sanhedrin 11 verse 3 implies that the teachers put more emphasis on the traditions instead of the Torah. There is greater stringency with regard to tra traditional rabbinic interpretations of the Torah than with regard to the matters, the matters of the Torah itself. Okay. The Pharisees, being very well educated in the Old Testament, introduced their interpretations of the scriptures as well being, as being more important than the scriptures themselves. And we're, okay, go ahead, Gordon, I think you have time for that. 35. Alderin. Mm -hmm. Alderini. Yeah. The Pharisees, knowledge of Jewish law and traditions accepted by the people was the basis of their social standing. Presumably the scribes and priests also had influence with some of the people. Jesus' struggle with the Pharisees, scribes, and chief priests can be explained most easily as a struggle for influence with the people. So said Anthony Saldarini. Yeah. Well, in this section of Mark, Jesus clearly demonstrated that faith is shown by action. He told the young paralyzed man that his sins were forgiven. Then Jesus healed him and ordered him to walk out of the house. The major controversy in this section, of course, was over whether or not Jesus had the authority to do things that were considered to be strictly the domain of God. In a context in which God alone was seen as being able to forgive sins, Jesus does so. Jesus is accused of blasphemy, not because he is directly claiming to be God or pronouncing the sacred name of God, but because he acts like God. Wow. In summary, the question being raised by the religious leaders was, was could Jesus be the divine Messiah? And we just have a few seconds left. Jesus points out clearly that he is, he as a son of man, the divine one on earth, has authority to forgive sins. The author of the gospel stresses an important detail. People uh, like the scribes recognize that the restoration of the paralytic, including the forgiveness of his sins, was a divine act. They were all amazed and were glorified, glorifying God. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for many challenging ideas that we've had a chance to study today. We have seen that Jesus faced so many challenges with so many op people opposing him in various ways while others were amazed at his behavior. May we take it to heart and make it a part of our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.